The B-29 Superfortress was, without a doubt, the most advanced bomber of World War II. However, this didn't necessarily make the job of a bomber any safer. Was this airborne superfortress really advanced for its time? It incorporated flight computers and computers for aiming the turrets. It also pressurized all crew areas, making flights much more comfortable. But these changes also made the bomber much more intricate and complicated, despite being larger than its predecessors. And the addition of new technologies, interestingly, also meant it had more ways to kill its crew. In this video, I would like to analyze the interior of these enigmatic bombers and how it changed compared to previous American models. And, of course, we'll talk about the curious ways these new technologies could kill you. If you were unlucky enough to work inside these super-flying fortresses, so you'd better get comfortable and welcome to Guns Club. In 1940, the United States High Command was much more concerned with the situation in the Pacific than with the situation in Europe. War with Japan was inevitable. And if that was the case, extremely long-range bombers were needed to cover the vast Pacific Ocean. The B-17 Flying Fortress and the then newly developed B-24 Liberator were not bad at all. The B-17, for example, had an effective range of 3,800 kilometers. But in the Pacific, the trips were almost always going to be really long, and the available bombers were not well prepared at all for the crew to endure such long missions inside them. A bomber was needed that could carry more bombs, that had much greater range, and of course that was better prepared for really long trips. Likewise, the Air Force would submit a request for an even bigger bomber than the one to come. B-24. Liberator and those from Boeing would win this competition against Consolidated with the Experimental Bomber 29. This prototype in 1942 would be designated as the BE-29 Superfortress. It was accepted over its competition because the BE-29 was larger and more refined than the already successful B-17. With this new model, they managed to almost double the range to about 5,000 kilometers loaded and in ferry mode. That is after having dropped the bombs and empty. This range could go up to 7,000 kilometers, exactly what the Air Force needed. The B-29 could carry 15 tons of bombs, while the B-17 could barely manage 7.5, which was already overloading it. And of course, the big improvement over its previous version is that all the crew compartments were pressurized. This was a big advance compared to previous bombers, because it made being inside them much more comfortable. Oxygen masks were used only in combat, while a heating system eliminated the extreme cold. All these improvements allowed the United States to win World War II in the Pacific. However, if you look closely, the B-29 only grew 40% larger than its predecessor, and the new version almost doubled all the features of the old B-17. Incorporating more fuel tanks, a complete pressurization system, and of course, doubling the size of the bomb bay. But if it only grew by 40%, how did it double these features? Clearly, it made much better use of the bomber's space. This is an accurate diagram of the interior of a B-29. And basically, the plane consisted of four parts. The first was the front cockpit of the plane. It was pressurized. And of course, it was the most crowded compartment of the plane. Here, the pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, engineer, radio operator, and navigator all shared the space each with comfortable ergonomic positions for their duties. Then, a little further back, was the weapons bay where the bombs were stored. Of course, this bay was not pressurized. Further back was the gunner's compartment, which was fully pressurized. And in this area, three or four crew members could stay together. The right and left waist gunners and the top turret gunner. It may seem odd that the top turret is far from the gunner's position, and the reason is that the top turret was computer-controlled. The gunner just aimed and the turret would automatically point at the target. In the back were the cabins and a not very private bathroom. Finally, we have the tail of the plane. In the tail was the only unpressurized crew area. 
You had to go out through this door to enter this compartment. Basically, it was a storage area, and it also served to reach the last compartment of the bomber, which was the tail gunner's cabin. You entered through this door, and it was pressurized. This was the loneliest compartment of the plane. In total, there are four common areas where the crew members could move around. But if you were observant, you would have noticed that the pilot's cockpit and the gunner's compartment are separated by the bomb bay and are not connected. How did the crew members get from one compartment to another? They did that through the communication tunnel. It connected both compartments as if it were a hallway. And due to the large size of the weapons bay, the only way to connect these cabins was with this tube. It was 10 meters long and had a diameter of 60 centimeters. The space was just enough to crawl through on your stomach, and it was covered with a canvas as part of the pressurized cabins. That way, you wouldn't scratch your elbows moving through it. If you were fast, you could get through the tunnel in 50 seconds. And this tunnel is one of the most distinctive parts of the entire bomber. But was this tunnel dangerous? The truth is, it was very dangerous. The B-29's flight ceiling matched the B-17, leaving it equally vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire and enemy fighters. If a shot hit one of the gunner's windows or one of the several Astrodome windows on the plane, bad things could happen. If any of those shots ended up hitting any of these parts, the plane would rapidly depressurize all of a sudden. Due to the tunnel's limited space, decompression winds could reach up to 150 miles per hour inside. If a crew member was inside, it would have a blowgun effect shooting them out and making them crash at that speed into the gunner's cabin or the front section, clearly with deadly results. The worst part was if you were nearby, you could be sucked in, and depending on how you entered the tube at 200 kilometers per hour, you could break all your bones, turning into a marble. That wasn't very common, but it happened enough that the manuals included a warning for all crew members. To prevent this, the crew members were required to slowly depressurize the plane as they approached the target area, so that if it was depressurized by a shot, absolutely nothing would happen. Officially, they would depressurize the aircraft 30 minutes before reaching the combat zone. At this point, they would use oxygen, making the aircraft invulnerable to depressurization. But if they were caught off guard before reaching the target, all of this could happen. Especially considering that before reaching the combat zone, the crew members could move freely around the aircraft. Definitely, it's impressive what these men had to expose themselves to in order to serve their nation. If you want to know why the B-17 sometimes dropped its ball turret, I recommend watching the video on the screen. Thank you for watching this one, and of course, goodbye.